We're going to travel all the way to Monrovia, Liberia, on the west coast of Africa. Now, believe it or not, Liberia was at one time one of the most peaceful and prosperous countries in Africa, enjoying all kinds of democracies and progress and peace like you'd never imagine. That's right. Well, that's until a day in 1980 when, according to the locals there, the devil came calling. Mm -hmm. Nearly 40 years later, Liberia is still struggling to come to terms with its checkered past. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you were there. Oh, it was, yes. And you bring us this wonderful tale of Liberia then and, and now. now. Welcome to Monrovia, capital of Africa's oldest republic, Liberia, established as a colony for freed American slaves back in 1822. Now tens of thousands of freed slaves made their way across the Atlantic all the way here and established their colony. They call the country Liberia after the word liberty and the capital Monrovia after former U.S. President James Monroe. For the next two decades, this country was racked by civil war, killings, murders, burnings, lootings, mayhem. And even to this day, the country still has not recovered 172 years after independence. The country's coat of arms said it all. The love of liberty brought us here and everything they brought with them felt like an extension of America. From the colors of the flag, known as the Lone Star, to the system of government. The settlers were mostly light-skinned, mulattoes or Americo-Liberians as they called themselves. And they quickly lorded over and suppressed the dark-skinned natives or Mandingos as they were known. On July 26, 1847, the settlement declared its independence from the U.S. and elected Joseph Jenkins Roberts as its first president. The country's main airport, Roberts International Airport, is named after him. For the next 133 years, the light-skinned Americo Liberians would help make Liberia one of Africa's most peaceful and prosperous nations. Another one of the country's most famous presidents was William Tubman, who ruled Liberia from 1948 until his death in office in 1971. Tubman Road in Nairobi is named after him. Meanwhile, Tubman was replaced by his long-serving vice president, William Talbot, a quiet, soft-spoken man who would wake up one day in 1980 to the unusual sound of gunfire inside the executive mansion, also known as the president's residence. It was a coup d'etat led by a junior army officer, Master Sergeant Samuel Doe. It is alleged that Doe personally shot and killed Talbot, signaling the end of more than a century of peace and tranquility. Doe would be in power for the next decade and Liberia would quickly spiral out of control. The uneducated Doe would surround himself with Americo Liberians, among them this man, Charles Taylor, whom he put in charge of all the government's procurement. But, according to sources, Taylor would pocket a percentage of every deal he made for the government. Doe would hear about it and would order Taylor's arrest, but not before Taylor got wind of it and fled the country for the United States with a reported $1 million in cash. Doe would call his friend, former U.S. President Ronald Reagan, to have Taylor arrested and deported back to Liberia to face trial. While in detention, legend has it, Taylor broke out of prison using nothing more but bedsheets to escape Hollywood style. By the time Taylor was returning to Liberia on Christmas Day 1989, the country was already in turmoil with Doe fighting two other rebel forces that were trying to take over the country's capital. Master Sergeant Samuel Doe would finally be captured by one of the rebel factions and, just like he had done with William Talbot, he too would be shot and killed, but not before he'd been tortured and mutilated inside 
the very same executive mansion. For the next seven years, Liberia would descend into what can only be described as madness and mayhem. A brutal civil war dominated by 10-year-old child soldiers pitted against rebel armies more suited in a circus than a theater of war. If it wasn't so sad and sickening, it would have been comical. One of the most feared and brutal child soldiers commanding a large swathe of Monrovia was a lanky 17-year-old ruthless teenager called Joshua Bly, better known by his nom de guerre, General Butt Naked, who led what he called the Butt Naked Brigade. I was controlling the entire Monrovia, the, from, the, from the University yeah. of, uh, of Liberia, yeah. a city, a place called Jalatan, the single fresh street, all the way here to the old bridge, to the new bridge. Yeah. Charles Cedar and Unimoke guy will only come in and then we push them back. So we were defending the entire Monrovia. The name was coined after the motley crew would strip naked and smear themselves with ritualistic potions before going into battle, thinking that bullets would bounce off of them. If we are naked like children, yeah. they should bring powder and dap us to put on us. So that statement turned us against all of the women. All of the, the people we're supposed to be sorry for in the war, supposed to be women yeah. and children. Yeah. But when those, when, that, when those women came out with that statement, you know, uh, uh, we, we held it against them and we planned that we would have destroy anyone we came across. The Butt Naked Brigade was as notorious as it was brutal. Pictures of them abound the internet. Needless to say, many of them died in combat. The so-called magic potions clearly didn't work. So you killed a lot of people? Yes, they, it, it, was, it was the environment, it was the time. And, and, and you, and, and old people, young people, all kinds of people. Yeah, everyone I came that we came across. I'm gonna tell you something this morning. Yes. Yes. This very nation so that has rejected you. Yes. As for General Butt Naked, he would later find God and became an evangelist, preaching to the very same people whose families he had raped, mutilated, and murdered. Is there a God can help? Now an aging 49-year-old who insists he's still paying for his past sins and admitting to me that he wishes he would be tried at the International Criminal Court in The Hague for the horrific crimes he committed. I'm, I'm still guilty. I, I, I am not justified for anything I did. There is no justification. And so I am still guilty. So, you know, amnesty do not mean you you are vindicated having amnesty uh, is like grace but i feel the entire trc process was abused so i think there is still need for the war crime court and when the war crime could come i also need to be persecuted now back in 1979 then president william talbert was made the chairman of what was then the organization of african unity he decided to impress his fellow heads of state by building a hotel that would last for decades. He called it Hotel Africa. 250 bedrooms, restaurants, a casino, a club downstairs, and this, a swimming pool in the shape of Africa. And it was pretty impressive. There were also 50 chalets that stretched all the way down the beach. I remember coming to this very place back in 1986 working as a flight attendant for Pan Am. We swam in this pool, we danced in the club, we slept in the rooms upstairs. But this is what happens when a country turns on itself. Rebel soldiers attacked this place in a decade of madness and mayhem. And the question is, how does one rebuild from something like this? when a country's worst enemy is its own people.
After years of fighting in and around Monrovia, a ceasefire would finally be declared in 1996, which would lead to elections the following year. Elections that Charles Taylor would win almost by force. It was about this time that I first met and interviewed this much feared warlord turned president who would rule Liberia with fear and intimidation for the next six years. By 2003, a new rebel army had gathered, calling itself Liberians United for Reform and Democracy, or LURD, which was threatening to descend on the capital, Monrovia. Taylor was outnumbered and under siege and managed to negotiate his way into exile in Nigeria, thanks to then-President Olusegun Obasanjo. He left peacefully on August the 11th, 2003, but not without a promise. I leave you with these parting words. God willing, I will be back. And return he did in 2006, but this time in chains and leg irons as a captured fugitive having unceremoniously fled Nigeria and was captured at Nigeria's border with Cameroon. How could I? He was repatriated to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, tried for war crimes and crimes against humanity, and eventually sentenced to 50 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Life behind bars for the former Lord of War. In 2006, Liberia held its first democratic elections in decades, electing Africa's first woman president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, but not before a hard-fought second-round runoff against former football superstar George Weah. Weah conceded defeat in the end for the sake of peace, and Liberians breathed a collective sigh of relief. Johnson Sirleaf would go on to be re-elected six years later and eventually completed her two terms in 2017. Elections were held and the former football legend, then opposition leader, was elected as the country's 25th president since independence in 1847. My brother. <laughs> this, is how you, this is how you live. Nice and simple, man. Nice and simple. Huh? President George Weah has been in office now for about 18 months, and already the pressure on him is palpable. His administration has been accused of everything from corruption to nepotism to cronyism. But the former FIFA Player of the Year, who faced just about every act of racism and opposition imaginable while playing in Europe, before unanimously winning the continent's most coveted prize, the Ballon d'Or or Golden Boot, says he is used to the critics and is prepared to captain Liberia into its next phase. They can trust me, you know, so this is what, we, this is what I got, this is where we are, and then we're doing our best to make sure that we develop our country. <laughs> 172 years since independence, a once peaceful and prosperous nation destroyed by more than a decade of civil war. A great lesson for other African nations that peace is sometimes fleeting and that war is just a war cry away. As for the recovery and the rebuilding, well, that, no doubt, will take a lifetime. Jeff Koinange, Citizen Television, Monrovia, Liberia.